Hello, and welcome to One World, One Health, where we take a look at some of the biggest problems facing our world. I'm Maggie Fox. This podcast is brought to you by the One Health Trust, with bite-sized insights into ways to help address challenges such as infectious diseases, climate change, and pollution. A One Health approach recognizes that everything on this planet, the animals, plants and people, and the climate and environment are all linked. Clostridioides difficile. It's a mouthful, so we're going to start calling it C. diff from now on. It's a killer bacterial infection whose very name, difficile, describes its nature. It's hard to treat, and efforts to kill off the infection with antibiotics often make it worse. C. diff causes half a million infections every year in the U.S. alone, and these infections will kill up to 30,000 people. It's so common and hard to track that there's not a good estimate of how many people globally are affected. These bacteria are everywhere, in food, in hospitals, and maybe even on your shoes. They're not usually a problem until the natural and beneficial bacteria in a patient's digestive system get disrupted, usually with the use of antibiotics that don't discriminate between the bacteria our bodies need and those that cause disease. One of those killed by a C. diff infection was Peggy Willis, a kindergarten teacher from Brooklyn. She developed C. diff when she was given antibiotics after a root canal. In this episode, we're chatting with her son, Christian, who founded the Peggy Lillis Foundation in her name. Christian, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Christian, could you tell us a little bit about your mother, Peggy Lillis? My mom was, was born Margaret Mary Daly in Brooklyn, New York in 1953. She was the third oldest of nine children from a big Irish Catholic working class family. She became pregnant with me when she was 19 years old and married my father <laughs> uh, in that order. Her and my father's marriage was not great. They did have my brother three years after I was born. And around the time that I was five and my brother was two, they split up and that began my mom's life as a single mother. And my dad didn't really do much in terms of supporting us. Throughout our childhood, our mother went and got her high school diploma. She went to college. She ultimately became a kindergarten teacher. She was just a very warm, caring, very funny person, very, you know, sort of gallows humor. I think because of the difficulties of her own life, she really developed very little tolerance for bullying or mistreatment. I came out as gay when I was 16, but she suspected it long before that. Uh, and then my brother uh, is dyslexic. I'm saying to myself, I was like, this 24-year-old woman who didn't even have a high school diploma, like going in and arguing with administrators and teachers and ensuring that we were protected and that we got every opportunity that we deserved. And she wasn't just that way with us. She was you know, she was just sort of somebody who always advocated for the best for people. A lot of what we do with the Peggy Little Foundation is we try to live her values and to teach her values. Can you describe when she was diagnosed with C. diff? As you mentioned earlier, she had gone to the dentist and a few days after that, she was awoken in the middle of the night, sort of early Friday morning with very severe diarrhea, you know, got her out of bed. And she took the next day off from work and she called her doctor. Being a kindergarten teacher, she did not think much of it. She assumed she caught a bug from one of the kids. And so it was only when the diarrhea and the other symptoms persisted for four days or so that we ultimately decided to take her to the emergency room. And so it was at the emergency room that they diagnosed her first with toxic megacolon. She was beginning to go into septic shock. And, you know, that was the first time that I had ever heard the term C. difficile. And... Then what happened to her? Initially, my concern with us going to the ER was I thought she was just profoundly dehydrated. So we took her to a local hospital, not like a flagship big named hospital in New York. And so following her diagnosis, they really did everything they could to help her. They had not at that point really experienced a woman who was 56 years old who had such an advanced case of C. diff infection, you know, with toxic megacolon, with the beginnings of sepsis. And so, you know, over the next 24 to 36 hours, they really did everything they could in terms of, you know, consulting doctors at other hospitals. They were very direct with us in terms of how sick she was. And so because she was so unstable when we brought her in, I should have white cell count of 40,000. 
she had a blood pressure of 70 over 40. They really needed to try to like get her stable before they could really begin treatment. And so overnight, they gave her antibiotics through a central line. They gave her antibiotics through enema because of the swelling in her colon. And the next morning, in what they termed as an attempt to save her life, they did a, a total colectomy. And for a while after the surgery, she seemed to do better. Her vitals got better. But then by the afternoon, she started to kind of crash again, and her blood wasn't oxygenating properly. And ultimately, she died around 7 p.m. that night. And although there's no typical course of C. diff, people often get profoundly ill, as your mother did, with multiple complications that hit very fast. Part of it depends on what strain you have, kind of whether or not you get treatment quickly. In my mother's case, she was prescribed an antidiarrheal by a doctor who didn't even examine her. And many doctors have since said to us that they think that part of the reason why her, well, particularly why she went into septic shock so quickly was because the antidiarrheal was kind of keeping the toxins and bacteria in her system as opposed to just letting it expel. How did all this affect you and your brother, Liam? We're coming up on 14 years, and it remains the worst thing that has ever happened to me. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think of her and miss her and wish she was still here. You know, thankfully, she raised us to be very close, so we had each other to lean on. It affected us in profound ways. I mean, it it changed the course of my professional career. You know, I think it, it really made us value each other and the people in our lives that we loved. And it also made us, you know, really determined that her death would not be in vain. I think if my mother had been hit by a car, if she'd had a heart attack, there were so many things that we could have been like, oh, that happens to people. But to lose someone, as I mentioned earlier, she had us very young. And so we assumed, you know, we would have her in her mother to be 93. We assumed we'd have her well into our own age and she'd have grandchildren and all that stuff. And all of that was taken from us. I'm saying, you know, Today, even the happy things, the the best things, you know, our weddings, the birth of my nephew, like, there's always a shadow of her not being there. I am so very sorry that this has happened to you. What made you decide to become an advocate? So I mentioned that my mom was, you know, uh, a sort of volunteer advocate for so so many people in her own life. And, you know, I came out... uh, as gay in 1989 at 16 years of age and you know the AIDS epidemic was you know it was early on in the AIDS epidemic and you know there were no treatments and so I became involved in activism around that and so I had spent up until that point in my career in nonprofit management and fundraising and had worked in the LGBTQ rights movement and healthcare and so you know as we looked around trying to understand what happened to her we realized that there was no patient advocacy organization for C. diff. And given the skills that I had, given how beloved my mother was in our community, we just felt like it was something we had to do, that we had to sort of make her death matter. What role can organizations like this one you founded, the Peggy Lillis Foundation, what role can they play? So as we've grown, we've done a number of different things. And, you know, our mission and sort of our programmatic work breaks up into three sections. The first is educating the public. Only about 40% of Americans have heard of C. diff. And to give a contrast, 85% of Americans have heard of Ebola. And we have had one person die of Ebola in the United States, and that was from a failure to rescue. So we lose about 30,000 Americans to C. diff every year. So Just having people be aware of the disease so that they can be judicious in their use of antibiotics, so they can suspect the symptoms, so they can ask for testing, so they can ask a facility they're going to be in, like, do you have high C. diff rates? It was about a quarter of Americans knew about C. diff when my mom died, and we're up to about 40% now, so we've had some progress. That's one part of our work. The second part is empowering advocates, so people like us who either lost a loved one or have had a loved one harmed significantly by C. diff, or who have had C. diff themselves. We recruit from all over the country. We train them. We help them to learn how to speak to the media, how to lobby Congress. And as a result of that, that all feeds into our last plank, which is shaping policy. And so we have started the first C. diff lobby day in 2018. 
we skipped the year of 2020 because of COVID. Uh, <laughs> and Congress wasn't going to talk about anything else. But otherwise, we have had a lobby day every year since. And oftentimes, it's the first time that anyone has ever come to that legislator's office and talked to them about CDEF. So, you know, we really look at like educating the public, empowering people who care about this disease to, to act on their own, and then making sure that those actions lead to changes in policy. You've also done just a small amount of kind of getting involved in approval of treatments. I think a member went to one of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration advisory committees. Are you going to do more of that? Yeah. About 18 months ago, uh, a new therapy or preventative but called Rebiota was up for consideration by the FDA for approval. And at these FDA advisory committee hearings, there's an opportunity for public comment. And so we got uh, seven of our advocates and myself, and we all provided testimony during that FDA meeting. And I think that that played a role in ensuring that Rebiota got approved. I think it's important that the FDA hear from patients, not just the doctors, not just the pharmaceutical companies. Like, you know, patient experience is really vital. And can we talk about this particular treatment that you were looking at? With C. diff, sometimes doctors take a completely different approach, what's called a poop transplant, to replace the good bacteria so they can control the bad C. diff bacteria. Yeah. So starting in around 2011, 2012, there was a nonprofit form called Open Biome that provided stool for fecal transplants. There were a few major academic medical centers across the country that had their own stool banks. And so fecal microbiota transplant became the treatment of last resort for people with recurrent C. diff. For us, we always saw that as like an intermediary step because it was considered experimental, which meant that it was not widely available. And so Rebiota was basically, you know, scientists and doctors taking the sort of essence of fecal transplant, making sure that the treatment itself is safe, is effective. And, you know, it is a complete change in terms of the way that we even think about combating an infection, right? So with C. diff, we need to give antibiotics still to bring the infection down. But because the infection thrives in a gut that has diminished good bacteria or diminished variety of bacteria, this drug then gives back that variety of bacteria and then prevents you, in most cases, from having another recurrence or from getting C. diff again. So we're really beginning to not just think about killing bacteria, but about the positive role that bacteria can play in our bodies and protecting us from disease. What would you like to see happening going forward? So in addition to the increased public awareness that, that we've already mentioned, we really have two things that we would really love to see. The first is for the guidelines for the treatment of C. diff to incorporate these new microbiome therapeutics and to incorporate them earlier on than we would typically see a fecal transplant. Oftentimes people had to have like two or three recurrences before they get an FMT. And we'd like for this to be like first recurrence, you get this. Because with every recurrence, you get sicker and sicker. So we've been talking about that. We just responded to guidelines from the American Gastro Association with our thoughts on that from the patient perspective. And then CDEF is tracked and reported by hospitals, but there are exemptions for certain kinds of hospitals. And it's not tracked in the population, in the community. And about half of all infections are now occurring in the community. So we have been advocating for and are, are sort of bringing up the heat on advocating for C. diff to be designated as a nationally notifiable disease, which would require that anyone who diagnoses it reports it to their state health department and to the CDC's National Healthcare Safety Network. Christian, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story. Thank you for having me. Listeners, if you enjoyed this podcast, please share it. You can learn more about this podcast and other important topics at OneHealthTrust.org. And let us know what else you'd like to hear about at OWOH at OneHealthTrust.org. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to One World, One Health, brought to you by the One Health Trust. I'm Ramanan Lakshmi Narayan, founder and president of the One Health Trust. You can subscribe to One World, One Health on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on social media at One Health Trust, one word, for updates on One World, One Health, and the latest in research on One Health issues like drug resistance, disease spillovers, and the social determinants of health.
Finally, please do consider donating to the One Health Trust to support this podcast and other initiatives and research that help us promote health and well-being worldwide. Until next time.